Hey everybody, welcome to lab 13 walkthrough for the craniata, or as your manual refers to it as the vertebrates, the vertebrata, whatever, it's all interchangeable, stuff's changing all the time. Lab 13 is the important part, quote unquote, the fishes, because that's where the focus is this week. Okay, so the first one uh, activity if going by the back of your lab manual is looking at the lampreys, uh, more specifically at the larval stage of the lampreys. You'll notice that they have a lot of similarities to the cephalochordates that we were looking at last week, so the brachiostomatas. Um, so you can see why it kind of goes step by step. In bold are a lot of the terms and things you should be able to identify. Uh, dorsal nerve cord, nodal cord, pharynx with the pharyngeal bars and slits, intestine, anus, postanal tail. Um, you can kind of see a lot of these on the, uh, got a little thing for you there to look at as well as a cross section. They wanted you to look at a cross section of there and you can see a lot of those important things there. The myomers are just the segmented muscles. Um, right there, delete that. Oh. So yeah, myomers, oh hey, ooh, that's new. Okay, um, myomers is just the segmented muscles and it's much more obvious if you're looking at them in real life in hands-on, you could touch and feel and you could you know feel the actual muscle. So here's another uh, pull mount. This is straight out of your manual. Um, what you want to be able to take note of is going to be the eyes, the brain, pharynx with gills, your notochord, and your dorsal nerve cord. Um, so those are all there. And endo style is here, right? So just be aware of what those are and then the feeding apparatus that you got going on up here. So that's the larval state of the lampreys. The adult lampreys, a um, little more in-depth and complicated. Things you want to be able to identify, again, straight out of the manual. Caudal fin, tail, dorsal fins. Um, and as you can see on, do, 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 where is my little pointer? Here we go, okay. So we've got, uh, so the fins, right? So these don't have any of those paired fins like you'll see in the later animals, in the later fishes. So you just got anterior dorsal fin. So the dorsal fin on the top, that's in the front and then posterior, got dorsal fin in the back. So posterior back, anterior front, and then the caudal fin, right? That's just the very back end of the tail, right? Cloaca, right? Cloaca is where you see this, see that for the next several taxon of animals, a uh, single opening for solids and liquids to leave. So everything comes out of one trunk. That's just gonna be, you know, the main body of the lamprey. Myomers, again, that's that segmented uh, muscle fiber. It's much easier when you're looking at an actual thing, kind of hard to portray in the picture. Um, external gill slits, you can see again, got that going on there along with the eye. They've got this single nostril going on up at the top of their head. The buccal tunnel, all right? Kind of like the feeding apparatus going on. I hear referred to as buccal cavity. And then just a lot of other interesting uh, bits that are I'm pointing at it with my hand um, to point out on this dissected lamprey that you'd be able to see. Take note, it does have a brain that is partitioned into three parts, but it's very, very tiny. Not gonna see it very well. Intestinal tract going on here. Spinal cord and nodal cord. And you can kind of see with the mimers, uh, you can see these little, kind of see that it's segmented and kind of ripply, but you know, nice proper muscle tissue. This is obviously a female if it has ovaries. Um, and photosensory penal organ. So the penile gland, that's gonna be called two different things, right? But photosensitive helps it detect light and whatnot. But it does have eye here, okay? Eye. Okay, moving on from the lampreys. Not, sorry, not moving on. Cross-sectioning of the lampreys. Uh, you'll probably wanna either pause the video here or look at the downloaded slides because um, these have a lot of the different cross sections you're supposed to be able to identify things with. So this is towards this. So C right, is towards the uh, tail end of the lamprey. You've got towards the, so A, it would be kind of like the head region. B is gonna be kind of like the middle section of a cross, 
the middle region cross section of this lamprey, and then C is going to be towards the rear end of this lamprey. So you can just see all the different um, locations of the stuff that you're supposed to be able to identify. So the lampreys, as we've talked about, have this very parasitic lifestyle, um, and you can see they do that very well with this science fiction, like straight out of a horror movie mouth that they have. And you can see they're parasitizing. Uh, I want to say it's a salmon of some sort. Can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but just latch onto the side, and they can leave these nasty scars. All right. Um, what we've got now is a quick little highlight reel of some video. Uh, this is from the freshwater region. This is a paddlefish, really kind of an important, I think it's a game fish in the Mississippi River. So this is freshwater areas. As we talked, these things can go from salt to freshwater in their life cycles. Anyway, um, they're a big issue. So this is in the Mississippi River. Um, so these lampreys, you know, you can see those open gill slits. Got the eye going on there. And as we get to it, boom. So they've got these hook-like regions that they allow them to just latch onto the side and then this tongue's gonna come out and that is what's gonna do all the damage and this starts parasitizing whatever it is. I mean, look at that, that is straight nightmare fuel. Boom. So that's the business end of a lamprey. And then, yeah, just gotta advance through there to do it. So you can see, boom, they swim up latch on and business is done. And now you can see, you know, they are not insignificant the amount of damage that they can cause to these things. And that's what they look like when they latch on. They're going to latch onto some glass and that's slightly terrifying. Um, but they will latch on to these things anywhere they can get their little mouths onto. Paddles in those soft gills that they get inside of that, with those gill arches and rakers. Anyway, Parasites, big problem. Um, I think the video, the full video is in the playlist and you should be able to see, but you can see there, they've done a lot of damage. So moving on from the lampreys. Next group we're looking at is going to be the minxini or the hagfish. So features to identify for the hagfish, you've got these oral tentacles, okay? Oral tentacle, oral tentacle going on there. Got these keratinized oral plates, very good for being a scavenger. They do not have any type of jaw, all right? So these things just kind of come out, but they're not attached to a jaw. And what makes them super cool are these pronaceous threads from the mucous glands. You need to be able to identify those glands where they're at. Um, and why is that cool? Well, first of all, these things may be a foot or two long, 
like, you know, an inch or so across, not very large, but they can produce liters of slime. Well, how does that happen? And what does it look like? Glad you asked. So you got a tank full of hagfish here, all right? And tank full of hagfish, they get panicky and they can make all this slime, buckets of slime, okay? What it is, is, well, I'll let this lady explain it in a second, but basically they secrete these threads, these pro, you know, these protein, these threads, like similar to spider silk, it's not spider silk, but something similar in terms of, it's just this fiber made out of proteins and mucus and it, as soon as it touches water, super hydrophilic, it loves it and it just expands and makes this massive slime mat. And that helps prevent it from being attacked. It's a good defense mechanism. Uh, as you can see, with, so a little bit of, so there's a guy's hand, not very big. Also take note of that super loose skin, right? Helps it so it doesn't get bitten, but a little bit of panic and boom, these things start putting out these threads, right? And that'll just choke whatever's coming after it. And I'm gonna let this lady from Gross Science. Fish are eel-like creatures that live on the ocean floor. They're ancient animals that don't have backbones or scales or even jaws. What they do have is slime and lots of it. When they're attacked, they can release about a liter of slime, which clogs the mouths and gills of their assailants, making them unable to breathe. The slime is composed of two parts. There's mucus and thread-like fibers. And these fibers are special. They're thin and act a bit like super strong silk. So That's the information you need to get from that. Um, and then so these things can live in all sorts of ocean depths. As you can see with this, the depth in the upper corner here, 681 meters down. That's the name of the shark attacking. Then next you're going to see it pop up, the species name for this particular type of hagfish. Boom, takes a bite, instantly see those threads get released and it chokes the shark. Those threads, boom, pop into its gills and the thing can't breathe. And a little, a little bit slow-mo, boom, threads come out, shoo, mucus, and the shark's choking. The most bizarre feature is but, its mouth. Look at this. Like something out of an alien movie. See those tentacles in around its face? No jaw, but it's got a heck of a mouth. Boom. This jawless maw is made for mincing up dead bodies. Multiple rows of sharp teeth are packed on two bony plates. With its single nostril, it picks up the sweet scent of death. And as you can kind of see, as it was swimming along there, it has one main fin going down its back. So that's fit for the minxini, the hagfish. Fish are eel.
So moving on from the hagfish, we've got the elasmobranchii. So that's going to be your sharks, your skates, and your rays. Right? Got a good old great white shark here and a nice manta ray going on over here. So important things to be able to identify on a shark. Okay? Heterocircle tail. We were talking about this in the lecture. So if you've got the mid midline on the shark's tail, right? Upper portion is much larger than the smaller than the lower portion, right? Not the same size. So that's that caudal fin. It's head of a circle, right? Caudal fin, just the end of it. Dorsal fins, boom and boom. Can't see that. Sorry, dorsal, dunk and dunk, right? Claspers. If it's a male, it would have it. This is a female, so you can't actually see that. Pectoral fins. Sorry, you know pecs, kind of like your pec muscles, shoulders. So think pecs, think shoulders. Pelvic fins, pelvis, right? Other things to take note of, external gill slits, right? They don't have that hard bony covering because they don't have hard bones, right? The spiracle is gonna be up here in the front and then it's got also a cloaca, which you can't see, but again, cloaca, one hole for uh, excretory for things to come out, uh, solids and liquids in one. Also, you got eyes that are going on up here, You've got nostrils going to be happening and the lateral line, which you can kind of see coming down the side here, right? Um, lateral line is how it detects changes in the pressure of around the water around it. What you can't see here, which makes sharks super, super cool, is the ampullae of Lorenzini, which as I was talking about in the lecture, is kind of like their superpower. Terrible analogy, but they can smell the electricity. I don't know another way to describe it to make it, you know, visual, but... They can just, they use it to detect the changes in electrical currents, and electrical fields around potential prey. And that is just amazing. All right, so moving on, look a little more in. Since obviously we don't, we're not in lab this week, we won't be able to do the shark dissection. Uh, but as I mentioned in the lecture, be sure to watch the shark dissection video by clicking through the link on Blackboard. Um, it's a really well done uh, couple of, videos uh, goes into all the details that we would have been looking at if we were doing the shark section ourselves. So be sure to do that. And yeah, so moving on. One of the other things that makes the sharks very special is they have those placoid or denticulate scales. And if you look at a micrograph, right, they look like little tiny teeth, okay? And you'll definitely see the difference if you compare these to those ganoin scales. Uh, or the adenticulates for the uh, rayfin fishes. So just remember, placoid scales, denticulate scales, little tiny teeth, remnant of ancient armored fish. Okay, so what we've got here is the giant freshwater stingray. Um, these things can range in size from just really large. A little video clip I'm going to show you highlights that they can, you know, this one is going to be about six feet across and 400 pounds. And it is just back massive. over the net. Um, I'm not gonna and this one looks pretty big with uh, an impressive sting. Anyway, so they were catching it. Sting. If things got this massive bar. Head of the science but team, like Dr. Ming, first secures the bar. Oh, skates, they give birth to live young. She's asked me to help her collect um, some venom so before we show, release the fish. Out, catches lots of big fish around the world. Really cool stuff. Okay. Uh, it takes six people to heave this right huge animal. Here, Turns out, for the first time ever, they happened to catch this massive 400 pound female. And as they were taking measurements, six feet across, 400 pounds. Six feet uh, across. This it started getting burst. Little did and I This is the first the time that they've ever actually surprises. witnessed a freshwater stingray giving birth. So we've just got the fish. Um, and it gave birth into to where the, science, two the scientific pups team while is. While filming, and there was a third one inside. And literally, as we sort of pulled it in the net. It's actually given birth to two be live, birth young. To live young. So boom. And these are freshwater. Uh, this is in Vietnam, I believe. Uh, the in the sharks, stingrays boom. give birth Big to live young. When and they emerge, these super, babies have... Cool. So moving on from there...
Okay, moving on to one of our little highlighted uh, local species. We've got the leopard shark. Um, if you guys ever go to the, uh, ever, you're supposed to go to the Birch Aquarium this semester, and they got a whole tank full of these things. It's super cool to look at. They don't get very big. As far as I know, they are no threat to people, but um, they're very prominent in the, I know the La Jolla Shores area. Uh, there's some really cool videos. You can see there's a really cool from a couple years ago. There's a sardine swarm. Water starting black. There are so many of the sardines, and you can just see these big openings where the sharks are swarming around. Anyway, they're really cool. Um, sometimes we would have had these to dissect if they got caught in a local fisherman's bycatch. But anyway, leopard shark. Look at it. So next, we're gonna look at the holocephaly, the ratfish. Um, apomorphies for the holocephaly groups are gonna be a pre-pelvic clasper. Remember the sharks, um, specifically. They had the, the males had pelvic claspers, really easy external way to tell male from female. But these guys also have pre-pelvic claspers, so they've got claspers in front of their pelvis. They do have an operculum, all right? So it's not the bony plate, but it is a covering over their gill flaps. So they don't have those exposed ones like you see on the sharks. And only found on the males is this cephalic clasper. So they have little claspers on their heads. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we still don't know what they're for. Best guess is that it is just vestigial. Um, there was some use for them way back in their evolutionary history, and they're just kind of left over, like the hind legs on whales. Yes, you just can't see them because they're buried inside of their bodies, but some of them they still be found with vestigial hind legs. Um, also note that they lack placoid scales, so their skin is smooth. So unlike those crazy little teeth that we saw on the tooth scales, um, they don't have those and they do have the lateral line system like all the other fish do, going down the sides. This is one of our local ones, the spotted ratfish. Okay. Hydrolagus coli, coli, however you want to say it. Anyway, that's it. Um, spotted ratfish, they're kind of cool. So moving on from there, we've got the Actinoptigae, right? Rayfin fishes. One of the classic ones to look at would be the yellow perch, or just perch in general, I should say. Um, things to be able to identify on them would be the caudal fin, right? And if you notice, it has got this hetero, sorry, yeah, homocecal tail, right? So midline of the tail, the top and the bottom are basically the same, right? Unlike the shark where one was much bigger than the other one, right? They've got anal fins, so that means that their cloaca is going to be right around there. They have got dorsal fins. They got a so dorsal meaning you know on the back. Dorsal fins. They got spiny one and they got the soft ones. They've got pectoral fins and pelvic fins. So they got you know their shoulder fins and pelvic fins. So he's just helping maintain maintaining stability and direction. They also have the lateral line system going down to help them identify. Sorry to help them sense changes in water pressure. The cloaca. Right? That is just that single opening for solids and liquids to leave. And now they've got a bony operculum, all right? So they got those soft gills, and now instead of just being a flap, they've got a flap with bone inside to really protect them, which is good because they are very delicate, which apparently wise, if you are being harassed by a shark, punch them in the gills, I think. I don't die. Um, but I think I actually asked one of my lab mates and they said, yeah, hey, whatever. Um, those are the things you want to be able to identify. And remember, these whole categories of, of fish, with the sharks, the rays, the skates, and the ratfish, they were not bony. They were cartilaginous, right? They are the conjunctees. These ones, the osteichthys, have bones, right? Proper calcified bones. And also known as the ray fin fishes because... Their fins have kind of, you know, rays going through them. Looking at the difference in the scales, remember I said there's going to be a big one. So these are going to be your adenticulate scales made out of ganine, ganoin. So the ganoid scales, uh, they have growth rings, just like we saw with the trees. Okay, here, the little tiny fish, year one, does a lot of growing. Boom, year two, and year three and year four growth. So they're not shedding these scales. So they have rings, right? Just like a tree. So that's kind of cool. Anyway, their scales, ganoin, ganoid scales, made out of ganine, 
ganoin as opposed to the denticulate or placoid scales on the sharks. Other thing you want to be able to identify uh, or be what a gill arch is, all right? So remember those soft gills? Gill arch is going to be the name of this whole kind of thing, the whole structure, right? And so you would have been had the opportunity to dissect one out, but we also had a bunch in jars. So gill rakers are going to be on the inside here. They're hard, right? Help kind of clean and protect the gills. And then the filaments are what does the actual gill breathing water exchange action, okay? So arch is going to be this whole thing. Gill rakers are going to be those on the inside there, and the gill filaments are going to be going on the outside there. Well, the next clay we're going to be looking at is going to be the sarcoptergi, right? Subclass within those is going to be the actinista, right? And the only two members of the actinista are both coelacanths. There's two species known. Coelacanths, super cool. As I was talking about in the lecture, we thought they went extinct millions and millions of years ago. Well, you know, fell off kind of with the dinosaurs until in the early 1900s, somebody was in a market, I think it was either in South Africa or Indonesia, because they, they're found in two places in the world now. There's a South African species, which the picture is here. And then there's one found in Indonesia, both of the genus Latimera. And they're in a fish market and they're like, they see one of these things for sale. And like, this shouldn't exist. This thing went extinct millions of years ago. And that would be like walking through, you know, bonds or you go to, you know, anywhere you go to an open farmer's market and you're like, oh, that's a chicken, that's a turkey, that's a velociraptor, what is that doing here? This should not exist. And lo and behold, they do. Um, anyway, the Soptigarii are the lobe fin fishes, which include these guys, as well as the dipnoids or the lung fish, which we'll look at in a second. And so they're just these massive lobe fin fishes, and we call them lobe fin fishes because they have four muscular lobes. So not just the little, you know, dainty rays that you saw on, like on a perch. These are muscular lobes that eventually lead into the tetrapods, which, huh, that's us, right? So kind of important in terms of evolutionary track record of things. But they're just these massive things, and we'll see one swimming around here in a second. Let me turn the volume on this thing down because it's a little weird. Look at the size of it. So they're still incredibly rare. Um, very hard to track down. I'm not sure many places actually have specimens. But they are huge. They can be huge. But you can see that lobe, those muscular lobes going on there, right? Down there, one, two, three, four, they're paired, right? Precursor to things walking around muscular lobes, big, ancient, awesome, the coelacanth. And the last thing we're gonna be looking at in the this well at all is the uh, the dipnoi. So there's a couple of different extant species, but dipnoi are, are be the lungfish. There are several species found around the world. Um, we're gonna be looking specifically at the West African lungfish because they're awesome, right? So what makes them special? Thin embedded scales, unlike you know some of the armored stuff or the other types of scales. But what makes them super special? is that they have this gas bladder, like all the other fish do, but they can breathe air, like us, okay? So... Lungfish are an ancient fish it. that can be found in Africa, South America, and Australia. They live in the murky margins of swamps and rivers. 
but sometimes water can dry up during droughts. Lungfish have found a way around this fundamental problem. Their strange solution has enabled them to survive for more than 300 million years. When their watery home vanishes, lungfish can turn to breathing air, like a mammal. Droughts can last for years on end. So the lungfish digs down in mud to create a burrow, where it coats itself in mucus, which dries to a leathery body bag, protecting it from total dehydration. The lungfish then shuts its system down and waits. It can survive for years, if that's what it takes. The lake and the fish may be long forgotten, but the lungfish will still be there. Its metabolic rate drops by 60%. What little energy it does need comes from slowly consuming its own muscles. It effectively eats itself to survive. When the drought-breaking deluge finally comes, the lungfish awakens from its dormant state, reanimated and ready to roll. On an evolutionary scale, this problem-solving was a game-changer. It has kept the lungfish alive since before the dinosaurs. So, how awesome is that? Anyway, that finishes up the things we're going to look at. That's the dip noise, West African lungfish. And so that concludes the uh, activity section walkthrough.
Okay, so that brings us to the end of Lab 13 activities. Uh, same procedure as before. Pick three organisms that were covered this week and give me the three sentences about them. Um, be as specific as possible as to apomorphies and how it fits into what you clade and taxonomic, taxonomic group they fall into. Um, there weren't as many specific genus and species given this week. So you can either pick the animals that I put online or that were in some of these slides, or feel free to just pick anything that falls into these categories that we covered this week. Uh, just make sure you are specific about it. You know, so pick any, pick your favorite fish or shark or ray. You know, if you have a particular hagfish that you like, go for it. Um, just, you know, as long as it's accurate and good, we'll be okay. Uh, 24 hours from the end time of your lab period ending, um, the exception of the first section, since this is getting put up a little bit late, and you should be good. So thank you very much, and make sure you do the exam. You have 24 hours to do that, and stay safe. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, also check in the assignment section, information about the virtual field trip is up, as well as the extra credit assignment. And surprisingly, nobody has written me about those yet. So either everyone's ignoring it or I don't know. But if you have any questions regarding anything, as always, shoot me an email. Thank you very much and good luck.